Let's bring in Matt Taylor. He's on the Menard Studio Hotline. Matt, good afternoon. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Uh, you're not in Cleveland yet, are you? <laughs> no, not yet. We will uh, we will embark on our journey starting Saturday afternoon. Okay, so you guys don't go up until Saturday. All right. Well, let's uh, let's start with kind of the the one thing that seems to be the one nagging issue with the Colts, at least from a fan's perspective, and that is Trent Richardson. Uh, there, the announcement came out earlier this week that they're going to stick with him as the lead back over Dan Boom Heron. Why does it seem to you that the coaching staff is so stuck on him? Is it a pride thing? Like they don't want to, they don't want to maybe admit that they've made a, an error by bringing him on. No, I think they think that he's a good football player. And I think he's a good football player too. I think the stigma that Trent gets around town here in central Indiana is that he's not rushing for a hundred yards every game. And that's what a first round draft pick should do, or at least a, a, a top three first round draft pick. And at least somebody that you traded for and gave up a first round draft pick uh, is supposed to do it. He's not doing that. Um, and I get it, you know, and, and tr- obviously Trent feels that he's not putting up the numbers that he wants to. He's certainly not coming anywhere close to that, but he's still a good football player. And he's just not able to, at this point, have the breakaway. Uh, he's not having a breakaway speedy types of runs, you know, where, where Boo Heron last Sunday against the Redskins breaks one from 49 yards away. Trent is more getting two and three yards at a time, but that's, that's a serviceable amount of, of production, especially when you need two backs inside this Colts offense and you need to get tough yards when an opposing defense knows you're going to run the football. You still have to be able to get that third and two, third and one. Oh, no, by the way, Trent Richardson is perfect in those types of situations. So I'm not trying to stick up for him because, again, I think if you would ask him, and, and certainly people have, um, he would tell you that he would like his production to be better. But Trent is still a good football player because he's able to get tough yards, and he's a very good pass blocker. He's an extension of this offensive line, which hasn't been perfect by any means all season long. So you need a back in the backfield that you can trust if you're Andrew Luck to keep you clean and, and, and make this pass offense, which is prolific by every measure in the book. Um, he certainly helps in that category. And the Colts' running game is not terrible. People want to say it's, 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 a, it's a weakness of this team. And I think it gets classified that way because the passing game is so good. But if you look at the numbers from an NFL standpoint, they're right in the middle of the pack as far as rushing offense goes. It's just because I think their, their passing game is that much better and they have so many weapons to throw the ball to that the running game kind of gets looked down upon. Do you think this will be the last year for Trent Richardson? Do you think the Colts will move on from him after this year, or do you think they'll, they'll keep him around for, for the last year of his contract? Oh, I think they still believe in him, um, and I, I do. I would expect him to, to be back next year. I think the bigger question is what they're going to do with Ahmad Bradshaw because um, this, this was a contract year for Ahmad, and unfortunately for him, he has spent the last five years at the end of the season on IR for a – a uh, various amount of injuries. So I think that's the bigger question from a running back standpoint moving forward to 2015. Talking to Matt Taylor, he's the uh, sideline reporter, manager of radio production for the Colts. It's ESPN Evansville 105.3. Uh, Matt, what is a fair amount of time? You talk about Trent Richardson, and I think uh, we've discussed it here on our show several times that he's the kind of guy, or maybe just society in general, is a very much uh, we, we want what we want and we want it now kind of mentality because of things like the internet and iPads and smartphones and everything else give us everything we want at a, at a moment's notice. What's a fair amount of time for a guy like Trent or any other player that has high expectations to assimilate to an offense or whatever the case happens to be and, and become what they want him to become? Well, Again, I think the fans and and the, you know social media folks and certainly the media, they have higher expectations of Trent because of where he was drafted and what was given up by the Colts in order to obtain him. I think if you ask the Colts, they're very they're very much satisfied with his production and what he is able to add outside of just the number of carries and the number of yards. If you ask Trent and if you ask Coach Pagano, like I said, he's a very good pass blocker. Um, he's a very good. Uh, he's very good at, at getting tough yards on third and short and down around the goal line. Um, I, I just think that people want him to rush for 100 yards and have 88 yard touchdown runs and and be the Trent Richardson we saw um, at Alabama and in high school, you know, coming out. But the thing is, I mean, I'm not one of those folks that that watches an incredible amount of game tape. I'm there on Sunday. I hear what other people say. 
And if you listen to Trent talk, he says he's doing his job. He says that people are stacking the box against him, which may not be the case for every running back that the Colts have rolled out there this year. It may not have been the case for Boom Heron the other day when he had that long touchdown run. All I know is is that the Colts are winning football games. They have a very good passing offense, and they're able to complement that with a, a, a pretty serviceable rushing attack. And I think Trent feels a lot more comfortable in year two inside Pep Hamilton's offense. So if you're asking me for a timeline, um, I, I don't know, because I think Trent's already there. I just think the expectations are skewed a little bit. Now, I'm reading reports that Vontae Davis was once again kept out of practice today. What are the chances you think that he actually is good enough to go out and play on Sunday? Because Cleveland just got Josh Gordon back, and uh, that, that could be a big deal uh, if Vontae Davis is not on the field. Yeah, it's, it's going to be up in the air. Vontae did not practice uh, again today, as you said. And um, by NFL measure, he has to have at least one day of practice where he is clean, has no problems, and then the day after has to get tested again in order for him to play. Now, obviously, we're on a little bit of a time crunch because the last day of practice is is coming up tomorrow, and then he'd have to be cleared again and tested again on Saturday. So um, that's probably the biggest variable right now at the end of the game from an injury standpoint. You need Vontae for everything you just said um, because Brian Hoyer is is, is really starting to force speed Josh Gordon here as of late since he's returned from his suspension. 29 of his last 70 attempts about Hoyer have gone to Josh Gordon. So he is um, here late in the season a definite uh, focal point of that offense. Well, while we're on the subject of injuries, uh, Matt, talking to Matt Taylor, Colts sideline reporter, manager of radio production for the Colts. It's Ford and O'Brien, ESPN Evansville, 105.3. Uh, Mike Adams sat out because of his back. What's the issue there? Is it a serious thing? Or will we see uh, any issue with him playing on Sunday? Again, don't know. Uh, these are things that have just popped up this week and, um, you know, obviously for Mike, he would like to be able to play on Cleveland because he's one of he's a part of that that big group of guys that have Cleveland Brown ties. He played there for five years. Dequell Jackson played there for seven. Josh Cribs, as we know, Coach Pagano coached there. We know rookie Jonathan Newsom is from the Cleveland area, as is Boom Heron. So, hopefully for him, uh, it's it's not serious and he's he should be able to play. If you don't have Vontae Adams or Dante Davis, and you don't have Mike Adams, that's two of the core of your defensive secondary. Um, now, I know Ron Landry has played a little bit more here as of late since he's come back from suspension, and the coaching staff has full confidence in him. But you still would like a full complement of uh, defensive players, especially in that defensive backfield, going up against a tough test and all the uh, wide receivers that, that uh, Brian Hoyer and this Cleveland Browns offense has to deal with, not to mention that they just put Miles Austin on IR, but they still have a full complement of guys they can throw the ball to. Talking to uh, Matt Taylor from uh, the Game Day Sideline Reporter for the Colts on their radio broadcast. You know, I was going to bring up uh, pass rushing. It seems to be one thing that when you watch the Colts on television, uh, that's one thing that the, the announcers usually bring up is that there's been a lack of a pass rush. This team does have 34 sacks on the season, though, but it does seem that there are times, especially against maybe the stronger teams, the New England game, uh, the Pittsburgh game, you could go back to the Philly and the, the Denver games earlier in the season, is not having Robert Mathis... It seems that having not having one guy shouldn't make that big of a difference, although it is Robert Mathis we're talking about here. Is not having him there really made that big of a difference for this pass rush? At times, yes. And to your point, I think you look at the numbers, it kind of bears that out. It's been feast or famine. Of course, the Colts had six sacks against Colt McCoy and the Redskins last Sunday, and that's a season high. They've had a handful of games where that's been the case, where they can get after people with a high degree of regularity, and it's been no problem. I can think back to the Bengals game where they got to Andy Dalton three or four times, and prior to that he hadn't been sacked in four games. So you look at the 34 sacks on the season, 33 of those sacks have come in Colts wins. That's eight games. The other sack came in the four losses. So you got one sack and four losses, 33 and eight. That tells you I think that's the biggest common denominator in, in whether or not the Colts win or lose is their ability to get after quarterbacks. And it kind of, it, you know, it kind of makes sense. You, you talked about it, the Broncos, Peyton Manning, the Eagles, and Nick Foles. Uh, they were able to get after Joe Flacco. That's a win. They weren't able to get, off after, uh, get after, uh, Ben Roethlisberger at all. And we know what he did against this Colts team, throwing for 500 yards and six touchdowns and setting all kinds of NFL records. They were able to get after Eli Manning, not able to get after Tom Brady. So what's the common denominator here is their ability to wreak havoc 
and, and disrupt rhythm and timing. And I think that is, uh, it, you know, certainly equal in, in wins and losses in their ability to get after people in the pass rushing game. With, with the playoffs coming up and with the Colts probably m- m- most likely to, to clinch the uh, AFC South, do you think Andrew Luck can keep up this pace of 300-yard games and multiple touchdowns going into the playoffs? Uh, I mean, in, in all likelihood, yes, but I don't think it, it really matters. I mean, if that's how the Colts have to win, then that's how they'll do it. I mean, case in point was last last week. I mean, they held the ball for a minute and 44 seconds in the third quarter. They ran five offensive plays and scored 14 touchdowns and had 129 yards. It, you know, that's just kind of it just kind of happens that way where big plays present themselves, and, and, and Andrew Luck is so good he can put the ball pretty much anywhere he wants, and, and Dante Moncrief emerges as a deep threat. We know what T.Y. Hilton can do and Reggie Wayne. But, you know, I, I think the Colts have, have proven over the years with Andrew Luck and Coach Pagano that, hey, if they have to win in the playoffs in a shootout game against the um, Kansas City Chiefs winning at 42-38 to 38 or whatever that score was last year, that they can do that. They've also proved that, you know, they can beat the Ravens 21-17. So, However, however they have to win is how they'll do it. I don't think they really care about the numbers and all the uh, statistics that go along with it. One more for you, Matt, and then we'll let you go. Speaking of the playoffs, I, I've been a big fan of the team for a long, long time, and I think the expectations by fans are, are high for this team because of Andrew Luck and, and T.Y. Hilton, and you know Reggie is certainly still on there, and, and defensively they've looked good and sometimes, and as we mentioned a, a few minutes ago, there's been other games and some of those losses where they haven't looked so good. But then I look at those games like the New England game and the Pittsburgh game and the Denver game, and, and I try to look at it realistically uh, as far as how deep of a run they can make in the playoffs. And it's one thing to be a fan and go, well, I think they can make the Super Bowl. But, I mean, realistically, they were going to have to run through New England or Denver again to make it that far. Is that something that you feel realistically they could, they could make a, a solid run at the Super Bowl this year, or are they still a piece or two away from making a legitimate deep threat into the playoffs no i don't i I do think that this team is capable of it and they have all the pieces um in place to do it they just have to do it unfortunately right now they haven't you know you can look at the four losses being to teams that are likely going to make the playoffs including the broncos the eagles and the patriots now i know the steelers are one of those you know they're in that log jam of seven and five teams but they are a, a a playoff caliber team you know they have to have some things go their way but you know unfortunately that was a huge game here at home against the Patriots had they won that game obviously they would have had the the head-to-head tiebreaker against the Patriots and you know if a playoff meeting happens uh, in January in all likelihood it's going to happen here unfortunately they didn't play well Um, they didn't run the ball at all effectively they didn't stop the run uh, we know that as Jonas Gray ran for over 200 yards, and um, you know Tom Brady was pretty much just a spectator in that game, handing the football off. So unfortunately, now um, losing head to head against the Broncos and Patriots, the Colts are going to have to go on the road in order to advance to the Super Bowl. They haven't done that yet. They haven't. I mean, last year on the road uh, to, in New England didn't go so well. Uh, two years ago on the road, Andrew Luck's first playoff appearance in Baltimore. They were in the game, but they didn't win. So they have the pieces in place to take them where they want to go. They just have to start beating these playoff teams. Um, I, mean, I mean, obviously in the playoffs, but they have to start winning these playoff games on the road. And I'll tell you from firsthand experience, it's it's a, it's a completely different environment playing in Foxborough in January in the snow in the postseason. I mean, it's a very difficult thing to do. But um, last year was was filled with injuries. Didn't have Reggie Wayne, um, didn't have Blaine Allen. They have all these pieces back. Uh, Boom Heron has uh, provided a, a, a very big boost in the absence of Lamont Bradshaw. So I think everything is in order. Now the Colts just have to go out and do it. That's Matt Taylor, manager of radio production, game day, sideline reporter for the Colts. You can hear him uh, this weekend as we'll have the Colts-Browns game for you with our coverage starting at 11 o'clock Central Time here on ESPN Evansville 105.3. Matt, appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Enjoy your trip to Cleveland. Thanks.